Okay, I think we can uh, begin. So uh, let me start by saying I'm Alan Barrett. I'm the director of the ESRI, and it's a uh, great pleasure to welcome everybody here today to uh, the launch of the, the, the study uh, talking about sex and sexual behaviour of young adults in Ireland. Uh, so we are supposed to have Minister Frank Feehan joining us uh, at some point. Uh, Minister Feehan will do the, the sort of official uh, launch, uh, but uh, for some reason he hasn't been able to join us yet. So uh, we, we'll just sort of bring him into the conversation uh, as soon as he arrives. So just a little bit on the running order then today, as uh, so hopefully at some stage we'll have uh, Minister Feehan. Uh, after that, then, uh, Anne Nolan, uh, one of the authors, this is the report written by Anne Nolan and Ina Smith. So Anne will take you through the, the details uh, of the report, and then we're going to have responses from Moira Germain of the HSE and Annette Honan of the NCCA. So just to get a, a, a sort of a broader view on the set of research results uh, that have been brought out. Uh, unfortunately, I'll have to leave the, the presentation uh, around 1.30, but my colleague uh, Helen Russell will take over at that point. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to launch this uh, new report and Anne outlined in great and interesting detail, um, I suppose the information on one of the most important elements of, of growing up, uh, the development of healthy and respectful relationships and sexuality are important areas of development for our children as they enter their teenage years. And the report we are launching today is entitled Talking About Sex and Sexual Behaviour Among Young People in Ireland. And it focuses on data relating to relationships, sexual, sexuality education in the home and school settings, and the links between activity amongst older teenagers over the age of 17. I understand that the data is taken from the Growing Up in Ireland study and that the report is the latest in a series of research re reports resulting from a partnership between the ESRI and the HSE's Health and Wellbeing Division. And today's study looks at information provided by a large sample of young people and their parents or carers measured over a number of years. I'd like to thank again, uh, Dr. Nolan for her work. And I think Dr. Smith from the ESRI, is that right? Um, uh, will present the detailed findings of the report later. So I won't go into too much detail now, but uh, maybe um, I, I want to touch on some of the headline items briefly. Um, the study has found that young people who have had discussions about relationships and sexuality with their parents by the age of 13 were more likely to have used contraception when they first engaged in sexual in intercourse when they were older. Um, I suppose uh, the, the, the report also finds consistent use of contraception is lower than contraception used at first sex and that over 40% of young people do not use a condom every time they have sex. This is obviously a cause for concern and we must continue, continue to push home the messages about STI prevention and the consistent use of condoms in our sexual health promotion campaigns for young adults. I know that the HSE is already doing great work in this area line with the sexual well-being .ie site and the Before You Decide campaigns. I also want to mention the recent partnerships between the HSE and the I IPU on the Play It Safe campaign, which provided young adults with access to helpful information to support them in safeguarding their sexual health and well-being during the corona uh, virus pandemic. All of this work is, of course, taking place in the context of our national sexual health strategy, a key goal of strategy is that everyone living in Ireland will receive comprehensive and age appropriate sexual health education and information. Uh, the strategy recognises that parents are the primary educators of their children, as Anne outlined, and as such, they have a responsibility for providing them with the information, education, and support necessary to prepare them for a lifetime of positive sexual health and well being. Uh, we also recognise here that many parents need support. And as a father, father of young children myself, I know this is a difficult and sensitive area of discussion for every parent. That is why the strategy also recommends that accessible and appropriate information, resources and support for parents should be developed and promoted. Uh, the HSE Sexual Health and Crisis Pregnancy Programme has made great progress in this area in collaboration with a range of partners such as the National Parents Council, the Irish Family Planning Association, and of course, the education and youth sector 
uh, work sector. Today's events marks a new phase of this important work as we launch an updated series of books and resources for, parent, for parents. These include Busy Bodies Booklet for Children, which has been a great resource of information since its first publication in 2007. We are also launching two books in the series, Making the Big Talk, Many Small Talks, covering the ages from four to seven and eight to 12. These will provide great assistance to parents who are talking to their child about relationships, sexuality, growing up, building on information provided in the Busy Bodies books. In addition to these books, there is also a range of resources on relationships and sexuality, which can be found at your local library as part of the Healthy Ireland at Their Library scheme. Today, we are publishing a brochure which lists these resources, and I would encourage everyone to visit their library online and make great use of the great range of information available. Evidence-based information is, of course, vital to understanding emerging tre trends and to ensuring that our support resources have a firm foundation. The report being launched here today is the latest addition to a series of research studies commissioned by the HSC, which explores how to support parents in this area. And I've no doubt that this study will make a very welcome contribution to our knowledge base here. It only remains for me to officially launch talking about sex and sexual behavior amongst young people in Ireland and the new booklets and resources for parents. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so as Alan mentioned, this is, um, this is uh, the second report actually in our collaboration with the HSE Sexual Health and Crisis Pregnancy uh, Program and the HSE Health and Wellbeing um, Division more generally. Um, so today, obviously, uh, the topic is talking about sex and sexual behavior of young people uh, in Ireland. Um, so I suppose just to very briefly give you the background and I suppose um, highlight some of the areas that we're going to focus on. Um, we all know that sexual activity is an important component of physical and mental health and well-being. And adolescence is a critical period for the development of positive sexual relationships. Uh, and I suppose in this context, um, the provision of information during adolescence is really important um, in giving sort of young people the skills and competencies to, to navigate uh, relationships um, and develop sort of positive sexual health behaviours uh, throughout their life course. And that's reflected in um, the emphasis on access to appropriate sexual health education and information in the National Sexual Health Strategy um, 2015 to 2020. Uh, and then more broadly, I suppose, in terms of the school-based setting. So uh, we have here today um, uh, a representative, Annette Honan, from the NCCA, uh, and they carried out a really comprehensive review of relationships and sexuality education, which is the, the programme uh, for sex education in, in primary and second level schools. Uh, and this was carried out in 2019. And I'll make some reference to that um, uh, as I go through um, uh, the rest of uh, the presentation. So the research questions that we wanted to, to look at in this study um, were first of all, um, sort of focusing on the, on the school setting. What are the experiences of young people uh, in Ireland in relation to, to RSE? Uh, and specifically because of um, the way the Growing Up in Ireland data is collected, one of the big advantages of it is that we can identify the, the school in which the young person uh, is attending. So we can see the extent to which RSC um, receipt and the timing of it uh, might vary across schools and are there particular characteristics associated with schools uh, that predict that variation. Um, but more broadly, obviously, uh, the school is just one setting in which young people learn about sex and relationships. Uh, their family is obviously a really important setting. Um, uh, and obviously as they age through adolescence, their friendship networks become much more important in terms of a source of support uh, and information for them. So we wanted to look at where do they source their information on sex and relationship issues and does this change as they age through adolescence? And then thirdly, I suppose we wanted to look at um, uh, issues around um, sexual behavior and what I've termed here sexual competence. Uh, and this is broadly a sort of um, uh, an indicator um, of um, readiness. Um, so sexual competence refers to uh, the sort of conditions and experiences around first sex 
So do young people use contraception? Uh, uh, and did they feel ready um, or did they feel that the timing of their first sex um, experience was appropriate? Um, and we also look at sort of broader behaviours around current sexual activity. So, for example, around contraceptive use and condom use. And I suppose tying it together with what we were talking about in relation to sort of broad sources of information, we wanted to see whether RSC at school and from other sources impacts sexual competence uh, and behaviour. So as Alan mentioned, this um, uh, research is really um, facilitated by uh, this wonderful resource that we have, the Growing Up in Ireland um, Longitudinal Study of Children and Young People. And the data that we're using uh, today for this report is from the 98 or the child cohort, which are the older cohort if people are familiar with the study. Um, so we're focusing mainly uh, on the data that was collected at the age of 17 and 18, um, which was uh, done in 2015, 2016. But in some cases, we also look at data from the earlier wave at the age of 13. And so, for example, information on whether young people had discussed sex and relationship with their parents, that information is collected at 13. So we can see how those sorts of um, factors change uh, as the young people age through adolescence. I suppose it's important to point out that um, these types of uh, questions, um, they're asking about very uh, intimate behaviours and potentially sensitive information. So we collect this information as part of the sensitive questionnaire, um, which allows people to be more open uh, in reporting in these experiences. Uh, and we've got a sample size, um, which is nationally representative, um, covers all the this, um, sort of a sample of second level schools as well. Um, and a sample size of just under um, 6,000 young people. So what I'm going to do now is talk you through the, the sort of the main headline findings um, from the report. Obviously, there's, there's lots more detail in the report, but I suppose these are just the main findings that we'd like to highlight, um, I suppose, as a basis for, for later discussion uh, in this webinar. So first of all, we looked at um, the uh, proportion of young people at ages 13 and 17 who reported that they had received um, RSC at school. So you'll see at the age of 13, um, it's about 55% of young people said that they'd received RSE um, at school. Um, not surprisingly, um, if the young people were in second year, um, a higher proportion of them reported receiving RSE than if they were in first year. Um, by the age of 17, then over 90% of young people um, said that they'd received RSE and there was less variation then across um, school stage. So going back to one of the main uh, research questions that I posed at the beginning, uh, we wanted to see whether um, these proportions differed across individual level schools. And we found that um, it did, particularly at the age of 17. So there was a lot of variation in that proportion that said that they had received RSE. Um, but it didn't vary for the reasons that we sort of initially might have expected. So for example, um, we might have expected that, that it might have varied depending on the, the size of the school. So, for example, schools that had, you know, more students, more teachers, for example, might be more likely to offer RSC, but that wasn't necessarily the case. Similarly, for example, um, uh, due to the ethos of the school. So that suggested to us that there were sort of more nuanced um, sort of policy and leadership um, characteristics at the school level that were important. Uh, in explaining whether the school offered RSC. Um, and I think that's, that's also supported by the evidence in that NCCA review that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, which highlighted a lot of variation across schools uh, in what they offered um, in terms of RSC and sort of the content and the timing of that. So we might discuss that at the end, and I know Annette um, uh, will give us more details on that. So secondly, then we asked the young people again at, at the age of 13 and at the age of 17, whether they had discussed sex and relationship issues with their parents. Um, so at the age of 13, um, uh, about 45% um, of the young people said they discussed these issues with their parents. Uh, and that was about 60% then at the age of 17. So that was one of the, I suppose, the headline figures you might have seen from the press release this morning. Um, Significant differences between young men and women um, at both these ages. So uh, young women were more likely to report that they discussed sex and relationship issues with their parents. Um, 
And also what really came out very strongly, and we ran a number of multivariate models to sort of unpick what was going on here and what were the major influences on these discussions. We found that having um, a closer mother-child relationship, so um, the relationship that was characterized by uh, more closeness in that relationship, that was associated with a higher um, likelihood of such discussion. So a sort of a, a better quality relationship uh, enables these discussions between uh, the young people uh, and their parents. Apologies, there's a, there's a timing on this, um, which I should have knocked off. Um, so thirdly, then we looked at um, the ease of discussion uh, with parents. So at the age of 17, uh, the young people themselves were asked, how easy or difficult do you find it to speak to your mother about sex and relationships? And then they also asked about how easy or difficult you find it to talk to your father about sex and relationships. Uh, so again, interesting uh, gender patterns here. Um, so what you can see is that, um, for example, looking at the two columns on the left hand side in relation to discussions um, with mothers, um, young women are, are more comfortable, I suppose, talking uh, to their mothers than young men are talking to their mothers. Um, but I suppose, I suppose the real headline figure to take out here is that um, both young men and women are uncomfortable talking to their fathers. Um, and even, I suppose, given that uh, young men seem a little bit more comfortable talking to their fathers than young women, still over 60% of them say it's very or quite difficult uh, to talk to their fathers, or even more concerningly, that you know, these issues have never come up in discussion. And again, um, the quality of the parent-child relationship. So we looked not only at, I suppose, the closeness of the relationship between both mother and the young person, but also father and the young person, when they were um, uh, closer and more intimate um, relationships, that predicted um, more ease in discussion. So again, I suppose, highlighting the importance uh, of better uh, quality uh, parent-child relationships. Um, next, we moved on to the main source of information um, about sex. So we asked at age 13 um, and 17, where the young people um, sourced their, their, what was their main source of information about sex. Um, so you'll see at the age of 13, just under half um, said that their parents or their families, so for example, their siblings was their main source of information about sex. Um, by the age of 17, this had um, really moved to their friends. Um, so exactly the same proportion then said that their friends were their main source of information. And that's not surprising, you know, as, as young people age through adolescence, their friendship networks become much more important to them. Um, I suppose it's uh, important to point out as well that figure in relation to internet, books, TV, uh, films. Uh, so 7% cited this as their main source of information at 13, and that had increased to 20% um, at the age of 17. Um, big differences between young men and young women. Um, so young men were much more likely to cite the internet and books um, as their main source at age 17. Um, I suppose it's important to point out here as well, well that we didn't ask about pornography um, and use of pornography at the age of 17. We did at the age of 20 um, and those sort of findings in relation to the gender divide and use of pornography um, uh, are um, apparent at the age of 20 as well. Now we don't know for sure um, if those that are reporting internet, books and TV and film use um, whether that's also capturing pornography, but we suspect it is. Um, so there's obviously a, a concern there. Um, and interestingly, what we found was at both age groups, um, those that had poorer um, quality peer relationships, so those that cited that they were more alienated from their peers were more likely to cite the internet and TV um, as their main source. I suppose going back to what I was saying in terms of, you know, we've very little information as to what exactly um, they're sourcing, what the quality of that information is, that is a, an area of concern. So next, um, I'm going to move on to some of the findings then in relation to sexual competence and sexual health behaviours. Um, uh, but before I do, it's worth pointing out that um, uh, these findings are in relation to the subsample of those who reported having had sexual intercourse. Uh, and that was about a third of the sample at the age of 17, 18. So 33% reported that they'd had sexual intercourse. Um, 
slightly higher young, among young men than young women, um, and not surprisingly, a higher proportion of those who said that they'd left school. Um, and the figures that I'm going to show next then are based on this subsample um, of young people who'd reported sexual intercourse. So it was just under uh, 2,000 uh, young people. Um, so first of all, we looked at um, that concept of sexual competence that I mentioned at the beginning um, of my talk. So sexual competence is, uh, it's an indicator that's, um, uh, that's got four main components. Um, so one is um, whether at first sex, uh, the young person had used contraception. Uh, secondly, uh, whether they felt that uh, sex had taken place at the right time. Uh, so there was no regret over the timing of first sex. And then there's a couple of other indicators that are not available in, in growing up in Ireland, but relate to uh, consensuality. So both partners were equally willing uh, and also the autonomy of the decision. So, uh, for example, the, the decision wasn't influenced uh, by the young person being under the influence um, of alcohol or drugs. But in growing up in Ireland, we, we had just have these two indicators of contraceptive use and regret over the timing. So. You'll see, um, I suppose, encouragingly there, um, high rates of contraceptive use at first sex, so about 90%, uh, and didn't differ between uh, young men and young women. Um, I suppose going back to uh, uh, what I was talking about in relation to where young people had sourced their information about sex, we found that having spoken to uh, their parents at the age of 13 about sex and relationship uh, issues, that had a protective effect and that they were much more likely to use contraception than at first sex. Um, but lower where young people relied on their friends for information on sex. Um, so there was a bit of a concern there about um, where they had said that their friends were their main source of information, they were less likely to use contraception at first sex. Um, in terms of the regret over the timing of first sex, so young people were asked at 17 um, uh, when they had had first sex, um, did you feel that it had happened at the right time? Uh, and just over, so nearly a quarter of the young people said no, and um, they regretted the timing that it had, most of them said that it had happened too early and they should have waited longer. Um, and I suppose the main issue um, uh, that we'd want to highlight here is the big, uh, big gender divide. So young women were, were far more likely to say that they should have waited longer um, than young men. So over 30% uh, of them. Um, not surprising, you do see this in, in other international studies, but I think uh, raises issues around um, uh, consent, for example, which I'll, I'll talk about at the end. So finally, then we looked at um, current sexual behaviors and sort of sexual health behaviors. And specifically, we looked at contraceptive use um, for those that are sexually active uh, and condom use. Um, and we found very little variation uh, across um, young people by various different characteristics in terms of their use of contraception. So it was about 80%. Um, I suppose it's worth pointing out, if you remember the previous slide when I talked about contraceptive use at first sex, that was about 90%. And um, here we're showing it's about 80%. So that suggests uh, sort of a drop off in use of contraception. Uh, so maybe a note of concern there. Um, and then about 50, well, just over 55, so 56% um, of the sample reported always using a condom. Um, so again, uh, concerns there, I suppose, over um, protection um, and sexual health. So just to wrap up in terms of the, the policy implications, I'll just take a couple of slides here um, and hopefully uh, open these up for, for discussion later on. Um, what we found was significant variation across schools in the timing of RSC, um, but not, I suppose, for the reasons that we could observe in the data, such as, for example, the, the gender mix of the school or the ethos of the school. Um, and that suggests and supports, I suppose, previous research that has shown that policy and leadership at the school level is, is really important uh, in driving um, uh, RSC. Um, we found little relationship between RSC receipt at 13 and at 17 and subsequent sexual um, behaviours, but I suppose it's important to point out that all we have is an indicator of whether or not the young person had received RSC. We don't have any information on how many classes, for example, they'd attended um, or what the content of those uh, classes was. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's potential for further research to try and unpack that a little bit more. Um, Secondly, uh, we found that the quality of the parent-child relationship uh, enables discussions about sex, 
and also the ease with which the young person reported those discussions. Um, and we found a protective effect of parental discussions at age 13 um, in terms of contraceptive use of birth sex. Um, so I think, you know, really highlighting the importance of the parent-child relationship. Uh, and I think, you know, obviously we're going to hear more from, from Moira uh, later on about the new resources the HSC has developed um, to support parents in having those discussions with their, with their children. Um, right through, I suppose, um, uh, younger childhood and right through uh, later adolescence. But I suppose it's, you know, it's important to point out these are, these are teenagers and, and friends become increasingly important as a source of information. And that's really apparent from the, from the findings that we're showing today. Um, one thing we would like to point out, I think, is the, the risks in terms of contraceptive use for, for those that rely on their friends as their main source of information. Um, and also, I suppose, poorer quality peer relationships. Um, we've shown that that's associated with reliance on the internet and TV um, as the main source of information. So I think what this really shows is the importance um, of following up um, these young people at the age of 20. So that those data have been collected by growing up in Ireland. I've mentioned, obviously, the issue of pornography. But there's also other information in relation to um, sexual health knowledge, for example, at age 20, which would be really important to try and explore more. Um, and then finally, um, uh, I'd like to highlight those patterns in relation, the gender patterns in relation to regret. Um, uh, unfortunately, this is something that you see uh, in other countries and in other studies in Ireland, um, but it does, I think, highlight the importance of ongoing initiatives around consent. And there's obviously um, some interesting uh, initiatives, for example, in the third level sector. Um, but I think that that gender pattern is, is really quite striking. So I'll leave it there. Um, so thanks to Anna Niemer for just such a wonderful study. And thank you very much, Anne, for the, that very succinct and interesting uh, summary. Um, we in HSE Sexual Health and Crisis Pregnancy are delighted to have partnered with the ESRI on the production of the report. There's just such a wealth of information in the findings for our current and future work. Now, sometimes when we have conversations about relationships and sexuality, we start from quite a negative place. So I just want to say that this is ultimately about supporting the development of happy, healthy children who have the capacity to go on to be happy, healthy adults. And in SHCPP, we believe that the development of a healthy and positive approach to relationships and sexuality is absolutely crucial to this. So although it's essential that relationships and sexuality education happens in every setting where children and young people operate, you know, in the home, in the early years setting, in the schools, primary and secondary, in the youth work sector, in, you know, the community organizations and further education and higher education, you know, today I'm going to focus very specifically on the home and on the role of parents. So, from this research report, we know, and from the previous report by Catherine Conlon in 2018, we know parents matter, even though sometimes they don't think they do. What they do, what they say, has a huge impact on how children and young people think and feel and behave. So just let me move on here. This is where my thing is playing up. Ah, yes. This is a lovely quote from Anna Freud, who said that sex is what we do, sexuality is who we are. So we want to be really clear that when we're talking about relationships and sexuality education, we're not just talking about reproductive biology, contraception and STI prevention, although they are very important. We're talking about helping young people to develop a broader understanding of their sexuality and how their relationship and their sexuality well-being is grounded first and foremost in a positive relationship with themselves. And out of that, they can form a relationship with other people, including uh, the option of healthy sexual relationships in, in adult life. So I won't be going into all the details of what sexuality uh, comprises, but just to give you an idea of the breadth, 
you know, it's looking at their an appreciation of their bodies, their gender, not an understanding of their gender identity, identities, their sexual orientations. And, you know, from that, they can move out and form relationships with other people. From research, we know that parents want to offer their children the necessary support, but many of them feel poorly equipped to do so. It may be because their own experience of RSE was limited or indeed absent. So what we know is that parents want trusted sources of support and information to help them make the experience better for their children. So the SHCPP, with our statutory and non-statutory partners, we're committed to responding to this need. And today we're launching the first three books in the series, making the big talk, many small talks, and an updated version of the Busy Bodies booklet, all of which we hope will help um, children and their parents have ongoing conversations um, about relationships and sexuality. So, whoops. Because our booklets start around age four, the HSE, in recognition that children get spoken and non-spoken messages much earlier on, offer mychild.ie, which is an amazing resource for parents of children zero to five. And it covers the whole range of information on aspects of early development, including healthy sexuality development. Let me introduce you to the resources and how we think that the parents and children might be able to use them in having these conversations. So I'm going to, because our resources that we're launching today are focused on the under 12s, so I'm going to take three examples of ages within that. Um, and we're going to start with baby Tomas. So if you can imagine, baby Tomas, his parents have access to information and support at mychild.ie. They, kn they know that Thomas's relations, relationships and sexuality needs are met by the way he's held, the way he's fed, the way he's touched, the way he's played with, the way he's smiled at. And although Tomas doesn't have words, he can trust that he's loved and that he's lovable. And out of that, he can form, he can build his capacity to connect with others and have them connect with him. And that's the basis of his sexuality and relationships education. We'll move on to our first resource. So if you can imagine preschooler Zora, she's a lively, curious four-year-old, fascinated by her own and other people's bodies. You know, four-year-olds, they're full of questions about the difference between male and female bodies, gender roles in the family, where babies come from, the list goes on. Now, because her parents have anticipated this developmental stage, they've read Making the Big Talk, Many Small Talks, four to seven years. And they've also read the little accompanying uh, storybook, Tom's Power Flower, directly to Zora. So they answer Zora's questions simply, but honestly. And she knows it's okay to be curious and it's okay to ask. Her parents give her age appropriate choices and they respect her decisions. And she's continuing to learn that her body is her own and that she's saying what happens to it. And although Zora, like many four year olds, loves to grab her best friend and give him a big hug, she's learned that it's even nicer if she asks permission first. So moving on, we come to. Hopefully moving on, yeah, whoops. Moving on, we come to 11 year old twins, Sean and Emma, and they're at slightly different stages of their puberty journey. In preparation, their parents have read and reread many times, making the big talk, many small talk, eight to 12 years. And they've been gently preparing both children for some of the likely physical, emotional and social changes of, at this stage. They've also given both children a copy of Busy Bodies booklet and have been referring to it over a period of time. Emma has already had her first period and although it was a bit scary, she was well prepared and she knew where she could get support if she needed it. Puberty starts a little bit later for Sean, but he knows it's normal. And although he, you know, he, some of the chats are a bit cringy, 
at least he knows and he's grateful for the fact that he knows what's going on with his body. Sean and Emma's parents have also talked to both children about how great their bodies are and how many of the body images they see on the media and social media are not real in the first place and or are not healthy. They've talked about responsible smartphone use because the children are desperate to get the smartphones before they go into secondary school next year, how to be safer online, how it's not okay to share personal information, their own or anybody else's, and they've also talked about accessing sexual uh, content online, either accidentally or deliberately. Sean, Emma and parents, they will have multiple conversations over the years as they go through uh, adolescence and into young adulthood. So, you know, this is just a tiny glimpse as to what might be going on for these children and their parents at different stages of development. And we just would like to point out that we know not every family is parent, you know, has two parents and that not every, ch you know, in addition to all the common things that children may experience during childhood and adolescence, there may be additional specific considerations for children with disabilities, intellectual or physical, and also for children who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, um, plus. So saying that, we just want to draw your attention to, and Minister Fihan did so earlier, to the other booklet in the collection, which is Making the Big Talk, Many Small Talks, the Healthy Ireland Library Collection. So parents, in addition to sourcing the information in the HSE earlier books, can go to their 330 libraries around the country, have quite an extensive range of relationships and sexuality um, education booklets and other resources. Um, and that's been made available to the Healthy, Library, Healthy Ireland Library Collection. So some key messages to take away for parents, that you make a difference, it's never too early and it's never too late to have these conversations and you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be open to listening, talking and learning with your children. So just to conclude, I would very much like to take a few minutes to acknowledge that although it's the Sexual Health and Crisis Pregnancy Programme launching these resources today, that the work has come out of multiple partnerships with a number of different groups. So myself and my colleague Kiva, uh, Kiva McLafferty in the Sexual Health and Crisis Pregnancy Programme have worked really closely with Catherine Byrne, who was the project lead, and Adele O'Donnell in health promotion and improvement, Cork and Kerry Community Healthcare, um, on Busy Bodies, and that originally came from our Cork and Kerry uh, colleagues in health promotion. And then on Making the Big Talk, Many Small Talks, 8 to 12, we worked very closely with Dr. Sue Redmond. And Dr. Deirdre Lundy from the ICGP reviewed and inputted into both those booklets, making sure that we were on track with up-to-date and accurate details about puberty and adolescence. In terms of the library uh, brochure and the project that's behind that, that was an extension of an original project uh, from Donegal, Sammy the Caterpillar, developed by Maureen Kerr, Lorraine Thompson and Lisa O'Hagan. And we've worked very closely with Joan Ward and Mairead Hackett and Linda Fennessy from the Local Government Management Agency in bringing that to fruition. I'm almost there. Just in addition, um, we just really, really wanted to acknowledge the, the absolutely invaluable input of the Busy Bodies Advisory Group, Nicholas Cosgrave, Martin Daverin, Meninia Griffiths, Amy Keaveney, Paul Knox, Lind Lisa O'Hagan and Liz O'Sullivan and they put in a huge amount of work to ensure that the booklet could be used in both the home and the school setting. And very lastly, I just want to acknowledge all the other additional inputs from the National Parents Council's primary and the National Parents Council post-primary, Belong to Youth Services, the Transgender Equality Network Ireland, Intersex Ireland, and HSE Healthy Eating Active, Active Living Programme and the HSE National Women's and Infants Health Programme. 
And very lastly, I would like to say a big thanks to the wider SHCPP team and to Maeve O'Brien, our interim program lead, who has been very much involved in both the research and in the development of the resources and keeps us all going. So just to leave you on, all the resources that we have talked about today are available to order in hard copy or to download from helppromotion.ie and are also available along with other information for parents and professionals online at sexualwellbeing.ie. Everyone, uh, first a word of thanks for being involved, able to be involved here today. And I'm going to restrict my comments to looking at the findings of the ESRI research report that Anne spoke about, and particularly because of its relevance to the work of the NCCA, um, particularly in redeveloping the SBHE curriculum, of which RSC is obviously a key and integral part. Because this research paper that's published today is of really great interest to us and very, very valuable, because it provides further evidence of the policy direction and the actions uh, that have been identified in the NCCA report on the review of RSC. So I'm going to just mention some of the common findings across both the NCCA report and, and the ESRI report, and then maybe point to some other areas of interest very quickly. Uh, the areas of overlap that uh, kind of jumped out for me particularly were um, obviously the significant variation of experiences of RSE across schools that Anne mentioned. And also um, very much we, we found that this is not necessarily linked to school size, to school type, school ethos, or even the gender of a school, but it's much more influenced by school leadership and teacher capacity within schools. So for us, this highlights obviously the needs that are there in terms of moving forward, and particularly it highlights the need for a comprehensive and holistic programme that's taught across all schools at all stages and all levels with um, the kind of professional development support that's needed. Another area of overlap um, in the discussions across both papers is the role of parents and a recognition of their, the need for a partnership approach between schools and parents, as well as the kinds of practical supports that Maura has just spoken about. And that's why these resources that Maura has talked us through today are so valuable. And they add to an already excellent library of resources that have been developed over the years by the HSE. So just want to congratulate and say, uh, you know, how, how important this is to have these uh, uh, updated resources today and, and say well done to everybody involved. Um, in both resources as well, we see that the main source of information about sex for young people is actually their friends. And there's a huge correlation there across the findings with 50% of 17 year olds in the SRI paper saying that they look to friends and 46% of young people that we spoke to in our, uh, and, and surveyed. Um, but I suppose most interesting or perhaps worrying is the fact that in, in the NCCA work, uh, less than 10% of students said that they look to teachers for answers to questions related to RSE. Um, the role of school leadership and teacher professional development is highlighted, uh, not surprisingly, in both reports. And there is agreement across both that the, the, this is the single most significant factor in the successful implementation of RSC. So just coming to other findings, in today's report, um, Anne also mentioned that over 93% of young people uh, say that they've received RSC in schools. Uh, which on the face of it might look like a positive finding, but when we look at the quality and the quantity of the sex education received, um, then obviously the picture is less positive. We know from the Department of Education Life Skills Survey that less than 25% of school principals in post-primary schools report um, providing the minimum requirement of just six lessons a year. And then when we talked to students in schools as part of our consultation, um, we really found out a little bit more, went deeper into the quality of provision. So even where RSC is happening in schools, students there told us it's not relevant to their questions and needs. It typically happens too little and too late. Um, it's very heteronormative in its approach and it focuses almost exclusively on the risks and dangers associated with relationships and sexuality uh, with not enough attention being given to discussion about the positive and, and enjoyable aspects and very little opportunities for students to develop the skills that they need to create and maintain healthy relationships. And so I suppose I wasn't surprised to read in the ASRI report that there appears to be good awareness among young people about the need for condom protection and first sexual encounter. Over 90% of young people saying that they use a condom um, for their first sexual experience. But 
uh, because students themselves said that when they're in senior cycle, the single most common topics that are taught are contraception and STIs. So much so that a number of the students said, if I have to look at another PowerPoint presentation showing STIs, I'll scream. But clearly the message is getting through, at least in terms of their initial sexual encounter. But it's probably more worrying that this awareness doesn't seem to continue um, and that uh, contraceptive use drops then over time. Um, I think it's also noteworthy that over a quarter of fifth years and a third of sixth years report having had sexual intercourse. And I think that's interesting when you put that side by side with the views that the students expressed when we spoke with them in our consultations, because they were really very strongly um, expressed the view that telling young people not to do something or merely pointing out the dangers of sexual activity isn't going to stop them having sex. And so I think this relatively high incidence of sexual activity does point to the need for a more nuanced and a holistic approach to sex education. And coming to this issue of sexual competence, uh, which um, is a major part of the report uh, that the ESRI uh, um, brought us through earlier today, and the two variables there that they looked at because of the availability of data in, this, in, in, in these was contraception use and timing regret. Um, from a health perspective, I can see that looking at through that lens, is, it can be quite helpful. From the perspective of curriculum development or from an education perspective, however, we'd be looking at the role that education could play in developing a much broader set of competencies. And interestingly, again, when we went, worked and, and spoke with young people as part of the review of RSC, particularly in our focus group meetings with transition year students and six years, they were really very aware and articulate about the range of competencies and skills that they feel they need to develop in order to have healthy romantic or sexual relationships. So they talked about needing skills of self-awareness, communication skills, positive self-esteem, positive mental health, and the ability to question myths and social norms, the need for an understanding of sexual relationships within the context of rights and responsibilities, and so on. And so when as educators, we seek to develop young people's sexual health or sexual competencies, uh, we need to be looking at all of these things uh, within a comprehensive approach. Uh, finally, I was interested to see that the report concludes that the findings are positive in relation to um, low levels of regret about the timing of first intercourse. And I'm, I must confess, I wondered a little bit about that because I did wonder whether the findings actually uh, were positive or were low for that matter, because nearly a quarter of young people expressed regret over the timing of first sex and over 30% of young girls um, uh, so they expressed regret. And especially when we place this finding side by side with other research, particularly, for example, the My World survey, um, and more recent excellent research from the Smart Consent team as well. And it shows that a significant minority of young people report experiencing sex where their autonomy of decision making or full consent is absent or may even be pressurised um, into um, situations where um, it's actually uh, rape is, is involved. So this is something that I think merits classroom discussion and certainly needs to be discussed in a timely manner before it's too late. So to wrap up, I just think that this report is really valuable. I think it provides further evidence for the direction of change that is needed if we're to provide more effective RSC. It certainly does highlight the need for an updated curriculum, one that's student-centered, holistic, inclusive, relevant to just children and, and young people's needs and lives. And of course, one that's supported by significant professional development for teachers, both at pre-service and in-service levels. And the report also correctly points out that schools um, on their own can't make things better. And while leadership is needed at school level, equally it's needed at system level in order to promote a multifaceted and multi-agency and collaborative approach that harnesses the expertise of parents, of, of teachers, of the informal education, formal education, health experts, all the various agencies and support services. Because without this, I think all our efforts will be piecemeal and regrettably, we'll be continuing to read reports such as this that reflect really poorly on the experience of RSC. Um, so I'll just finish on that note and um, be delighted to take questions. I don't know if uh, uh, Emer and Anne, if you wanted to pick up on anything uh, before I go to the questions from, from the uh, responses. Um, well, like, I think we'd, well, let's let's give let's people, I suppose, okay. yeah, and, as a, to ask questions. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, and I, I, I think we could, we've scheduled 10 minutes for questions, so uh, hopefully if people can uh, can stay with us for that, because there, there is uh, so much to discuss here. What I'll do is just, I'll take, um, maybe group a few questions together to you both, and you, you, you can take them as you like. So I suppose uh, what, the first one is around, um, a couple of people are asking around the socio-demographics and reaching um, disadvantaged groups. So I know in your study you were looking at um, differences across social classes as well, and and, and they weren't maybe as as you anticipated. So if you could, uh, yeah, address that and 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 how to reach, I suppose, more disad disadvantaged groups. Um, secondly, there's a number of um, questions here about um, data collection and, in particular, how we may get at those issues uh, around, you know, pornography use um, and sexual initiation. I think these were these were some of the issues that that you uh, couldn't address with the, the data currently. But if you have some um, advice on how we get good um, information on that, given their given their importance. Uh, and if I'll if I'll just give you one uh, more uh, kind of bigger one is around the timing of interventions, the timing of um, information. Um, so the discussion um, here and, and, and in Annette's, um, Annette's response was around consent and, and the, the issues around that. So if, if uh, we need to be educating around consent earlier on uh, and at what time that's appropriate. So if you'd like to take those and then I'll gather some more. Great. Um Emer, I might just start on the on the last um, question sure. and maybe give you maybe the socioeconomics because I know there's a bit of that done as far as the school level variation. Um, so I suppose the, the 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 question around the timing of interventions and I think um, uh, it's really well made. Um, I think uh, particularly in relation to those findings um, that I ended on in relation to um, the sort of big gender patterns in relation to regret. Um, obviously, I mentioned uh, initiatives in the third level sector, but, you know, I think what's really clear from this is that those things need to, those discussions need to happen much earlier. Um, and Annette mentioned uh, the sort of the, the survey um, of students as part of the NCCA review. And I think one thing that came out very strongly from that, from the perspective of the students themselves, was that they wanted much more information on how to navigate um, uh, relationships. So, she said, you know, it was far less about, you know, the sort of biological aspects of sex that they wanted to know about, but they wanted to know about, for example, you know, uh, all of this discussion around consent, how to navigate those relationships, even just sort of more general things about how to break up with a boyfriend or girlfriend. You know, it, it's sort of all those skills and competencies that we as adults need to be able to navigate um, through and healthy relationships. So I think um, that aspect um, certainly of the curriculum is one side, but then obviously in terms of you know discussions um, between uh, within families as well, um, I think those aspects need to be um, brought out uh, much earlier. So yeah, we very much agree um, with that. Um, I might just take the point in relation to data collection. Um, I think yeah, the 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 point around um, at the age of seventeen, we unfortunately weren't able to ask about um, use of pornography. Um, we did ask it at the age of 20 when these young people were followed up um, uh, last year. Um, so uh, we will be publishing um, sort of headline figures on those um, uh, in the next while. But I suppose one thing that came out very strongly was, again, that sort of very big gender pattern in relation to use of pornography. Young men were much more likely to use it and much more intensive users of pornography um, than young women. Um, so concerns there, obviously. Um, and then finally, I think the, the point around, um, you know, sexual initiation. So that's obviously one big gap in uh, the GUI data that we have is we don't know the age at which um, they first had sex. And there's certainly if you look at some of the patterns we have, for example, in relation to regret or contraceptive use, you know, it's likely that some of those are also been driven by differences in the age at which young people first had sex. So you know, I would absolutely agree that we, we do need this information. There's obviously ethical issues around the collection of this information with young people, but I don't think that should be a barrier to trying to collect this information because of the value of it. Um, it has been done elsewhere. So you'll see, for example, the, the My World survey, for example, has asked, 
young people about use of pornography and sort of wider discussions around consent. So I think um, it can be done and I think it can be done carefully and sensitively in a way that protects um, uh, young people themselves, but also gives you this resource that's really, really important for their future well-being. Um, so Imer, I might hand over to you for the, um, the socioeconomic question. Yes, I mean, we were actually surprised at how few differences there were by socioeconomic background and between DESH and non-DESH schools. We had anticipated greater difficulties, but we did identify one group that were more reliant on school-based information because they weren't having the same level of, of discussion with their parents. And these were males from low-income households, but also living in rural areas that in particular for fathers, um, rural fathers seem to be less likely to discuss uh, sex and relationships with their children. Um, I'll answer another question, if I may, Helen, that came up on, on the discussion around children with disabilities and special educational needs, because we didn't get a chance to mention them yet. Uh, and we did look at this group. And again, we find relatively few differences. There are two areas where differences emerge. And we were looking to note, we were looking at them as a group, not breaking it down by particular uh, conditions or experiences. But there were two differences. One, that this group of young people were somewhat less likely to rely on friends for information about sex and slightly more likely to rely on, on their teachers. And then um, secondly, they were less likely to be sexually active by 17 years of age. But other, in other respects, like the nature of, uh, and, and level of discussion, ease of discussion between parents and children were all similar for those groups. Thanks, thanks, Seymour. And, uh, and I thought that was a really well-made point to think about the way of asking these questions in, a, in an ethical and, and, and sensitive way. Um, there's another couple of, of questions here, if I could squeeze in a few more. So um, a couple are around different subgroups again. So around uh, whether you can say anything with the, with the data around um, young people from different ethnic minority groups uh, or travelers, um, and also around uh, um, LGBT groups, uh, whether there was any, any differences there. I suppose there was a question for the other panelists there about the um, nature of the information and the uh, education programs and, and uh, LGBT um, issues. Will I, will I answer that, Anne? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I mean, we did uh, look at migrant groups um, rather than ethnic groups, and mm. there was very little variation in, in patterns. Travellers are included in the study, but in numbers too small to be reported separately because that it is a large scale sample survey, but because travellers are a small proportion within the population as a whole, they're, they're not represented in significant numbers. Um, the other issue would be to look at, we wanted to be able to break it out by um, sexual orientation. Uh, at, at 17, 18 years of age, 2% of, of the young people define themselves as gay and 5% as bisexual, with a, another small group who said they prefer not to say or they were unsure. And because those numbers were relatively small, that we broke it down by those who were sexually active, they were too small and, uh, to, and they would have been disclosive. So we couldn't break that out. And it's very much not that we're not aware of those issues, but that just because we were restricted by, by the, the, those kind of numbers issue. But Annette might like to say a bit more about her point about the heteronormativity of, of existing provision. Uh, thanks, Amy. Well, it came through very strongly in our consultations with the young people themselves. Unprompted, they spoke about their experiences of schools and the kinds of stories and the narratives and the, and the materials that are used um, very much uh, taking a binary approach. And uh, even children in upper primary school were conscious of that and were able to articulate that, which I found really interesting. And obviously, as, as, as we spoke to older groups, they were even uh, more aware of it and quite, quite upset and, uh, about it because they saw this as very discriminatory for their peers in the classroom who were made to feel invisible as they, as they expressed it. So that was really interesting. Can I come in on, a, on another point that has just been raised earlier as well in relation to the disadvantaged or uh, disadvantaged Affected groups because I was really interested as well that the likelihood of teenagers being sexually active and um, according to your report 
uh, is higher if they're disaffected from school. I found that really interesting because it underscores for me and it highlights and serves as a reminder of the importance of a whole school culture uh, and particularly one that supports school, uh, student well-being because a key part of, of well-being is uh, this sense of connection and a sense of belonging to school and without that then maybe what we don't realise that one of the knock-on effects can be actually um, early um, sexual activity and I, I think it's probably uh, a piece of uh, evidence that people wouldn't be wouldn't have been aware of including myself until I read, read it in your report today so I found that interesting and it's further evidence of the importance of, of really looking at the, the whole well-being um, space within schools and what's happening there. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, Moira yes if you want to just come in uh... Briefly, yeah. I'll come in briefly. Um, just to say a little bit about the LGBTI plus uh, within the RSC curriculum. Um, as Annette will know, we're working at the moment with Annette and um, with the education need in the HSC around developing um, activities for junior cycle RSC. Um, and within that, we are very, very conscious of trying to make it as inclusive as possible and to allow for you know the variations across gender orientation or sexual orientations and gender identity and to much more integrate it into the activities in the classroom. We have an, an older resource that we developed with the Department of Education growing up LGBT in Ireland um, and that is used in some schools. And that was really good at the time, but now we're looking for a much more integrated approach. So hopefully the students and the young people will see the, the outcomes of that in future years. Thank you very much. Um, so we're, we're uh, now up at 10 past, so I would, uh, I think we'd better wrap up, despite the fact that there's still, uh, still I'm sure, lots of questions. And it's a credit to, um, all of the um, participants and the panelists that we still have a, a big audience who have stayed with us for the, for the whole discussion. So um, thank you all very much. Thanks to the, um, the HSE for funding the study and, uh, and say thank you very much to the participants and to the, the minister for launching. I would encourage everyone to, um, to uh, download the, the report and the um, and the resources that uh, that the HSE have have produced. So uh, uh, just thank you all very much for for uh, listening in today and for all the uh, questions that uh, that people have put here. So thank you very much. Hopefully we'll see you again soon.